There are five main uses of undeveloped African landscapes, settlements, farmland, mining operations, logging, or tourism. Only tourism has a real potential for conserving natural areas. But even this usage has its downside. For example, many people suggest that photographic tourism alone is a viable method for maintaining wildlife in their habitats. However, as pointed out by noted conservationist Ivan Carter, photographic tourism often leads to a significant environmental degradation. Ivan uses the example of South Africa's Kruger National Park. He asks, is it sustainable to dig boreholes that pump huge quantities of water to the surface to attract the animals so that tourists can photograph them? And is it possible to maintain the huge network of roads to transport tourists without major environmental disturbance? The answer to both questions is of course no, but this does not mean that photographic tourism is a poor use of African landscapes. However, there may be a less destructive type of tourism. Let's consider a model system for this less destructive path this model comes from the country of Mozambique. During the Civil War in Mozambique, there was no food and no jobs. Children were suffering from chronic malnutrition and severe protein deficiency. With no other options for survival, family units depended on poaching to bring in protein to keep themselves alive. Poaching drove game animals to near extinction. Many species of plants, bird life, and mammals disappeared. The ecosystem within what is known as the Marameo complex of the Zambezi Delta deteriorated. Just after the Civil War ended in 1992, people from the capital city of Maputo and neighboring South Africa arrived in the Marameo complex. They held meetings with the Santa tribal chiefs and their people. They explained to them that they had a vision to restore not only the villagers' lives, but also the ecosystem within which they lived. Their vision included the recovery of native plants, songbirds, small amphibians, insects, and yes, all of the larger mammals that poachers coveted. They emphasized that for this resurrection to occur, the Senna people and the outsiders must work hand in hand. The newcomers described the first critical action that must take place without which it would be impossible to achieve the seemingly unimaginable vision of. What was this first step? It involved the provision of a consistent supply of meat to the Senna families. But where would it come from? As with the minimal protein brought in by the villagers poaching, the source would be game animals. However, unlike the indiscriminate poaching by the villagers, international trophy hunters would be the source. All of the meat from the strictly regulated sport hunting would go to feed the local villagers and the international hunters. The goal was to provide 10 pounds of meat per week for each of the Santa families. However, unlike the whole scale killing of animals by poachers, the sport hunters would be taking only a few of the older males each year from each game species. As the weekly provision of 10 pounds of meat from the trophy hunting came to pass, poaching became unnecessary for the villagers' survival. In their initial meetings, the newcomers emphasized a second step needed for ecosystem restoration. They proposed to use the funds from the trophy hunters to hire anti-poaching units. They pointed out that the best recruits for the anti-poaching units would be former poachers. These men would know where to find animals and thus where to find the camps of the invading poaching squads. They would also be able to approach camps with the skill necessary to capture the poachers. If willing to ply their skills for ecosystem restoration and conservation rather than the whole scale slaughter of game animals, the reformed poachers actions could quickly turn the tide of species extinction. The Santa poachers listened and agreed to fill the ranks of the newly formed anti-poaching teams. It was not just, though, to the anti-poaching teams that the former poachers gravitated. The Zambezi Delta Safaris Company needed game trackers as well. 
On a recent trip to the Marameo complex, I witnessed firsthand the incredible skill of Santa hunters. I also learned the difference between regulated sport hunting and the wanton destruction of wildlife through poaching. On this particular morning, I followed my professional hunter, Julian, who followed behind our two Santa tribesmen trackers, Francisco and Dolish. Both former poachers, they moved wraith-like through the interlocking vegetation with their hands grasped behind their backs to keep body movement to an absolute minimum. They made no noise discernible to my electronic earplugs as they worked their way deeper into the gloom of the forest. We were hunting for one older male of a species known locally as Sunni. But Francisco and Dolish, as poachers, would have killed hundreds of animals on their raids, males, females, young, old. In fact, just a few weeks before I arrived, a Zambezi Delta Safari's anti-poaching squad raided a poacher's camp, finding nearly 100 of the tiny Sunni antelopes in a pile. Just one poaching team on one raid and 100 dead Sunni antelopes. Not for the poachers' own hungry bellies were these taken, but killed to sell in distant markets. I was witnessing master craftsmen in Francisco and Dolish. Yes, master poachers, but now plying their skills to lead international hunters like me, the funders of the regenerative steps for the local people and their environment. I was paying license fees, trophy fees, daily fees, and community fees to take one animal and by doing so was helping stop those who would destroy the entire ecosystem. With poaching controlled through funds supplied by hunters, animal populations have grown from near extinction to carrying capacities and beyond. When Zambezi Delta Safaris began their operation, sable antelopes, waterbucks, and zebras, or zebras, were nearly impossible to find. This was understandable, with only 30 sables, 200 water bucks and eight zebras having survived the intense poaching. Protection of these and other trophy species from destruction by the bushmeat trade was key, but also regulated sport hunting did not begin until population sizes and growth were sustainable. Quotas for hunting are set by the government scientists in concert with the area outfitter, whose job it is to protect the animals, enforce the quotas on sport hunters, and work with the local villagers. The results of the anti-poaching efforts, supported by the funds from international sport hunters, are apparent from the three species already named. Since Zambezi Delta safaris began their work, sable antelopes have increased from 30 to 3,000, water bucks from a few hundred to approximately 25,000, zebras from eight to over 1,200. Though the successful suppression of meat poaching in the Marameo complex was effective early in the Zambezi Delta Safari's tenure, habitat loss due to slash and burn agriculture continued to be a major concern. This agricultural practice is common in developing countries, with local villagers clearing an area around their homes by cutting down the vegetation and burning the fallen trees and bushes. Similar to the development of housing subdivisions in North America, the habitat remaining is rarely useful for local wildlife. To combat habitat loss from such agricultural practices, Zambezi Delta Safaris undertook two major initiatives. First, with funding from the Dallas Safari Club, they developed a 65 hectare, or approximately 160 acre community agricultural field. The safari staff use a tractor and plow purchased with hunter funding to prepare the field for the Santa villagers. Each participating family receives an allocation of one hectare plus fertilizer at the beginning and middle of the growing season. Locating the field in a single area prevents the development of 65 separate agricultural fields throughout the Marameo complex. This allows previously cleared areas to regenerate. The second initiative was even more ambitious and effective. The Zambezi Delta Safari's owner-operator, Mark Haldane, again met with the Senate chiefs and their villagers. 
This time, Mark and his staff asked them if they would be willing to move their small settlements to a centralized location. This was a completely voluntary program, but Mark and his colleagues proposed to find funding for a school, housing for teachers, and a clinic all to be located near the resettlement area. The Zambezi Delta Safaris plan also included a cash payment to any who wished to take up the offer of resettlement. The resettlement program has been wildly successful, with every small village now having moved to a centralized single region. The migration has been beneficial to the people, bringing children close to their school and all the villagers within a short walk of the clinic. Hunter funds paid for all parts of this program, and the result for wildlife has been the restoration of large tracts of the Zambezi Delta and the Marameo complex. Without hunter funds, there would have been no suppression of poaching or cessation of slash and burn agriculture in this portion of Mozambique. With the significant funding provided by passionate sportswomen and men, dedicated conservation of not only game animals, but songbirds, trees, frogs, and insects, there are now millions of acres of restored and protected wild Africa. Of all the uses for African landscapes, sport hunting by far leaves the smallest carbon footprint and provides the greatest opportunity for the resurrection of entire ecosystems. Thank you.